In the news tonight, interveners challenge the method used by the Fair Trading Commission to calculate the Barbados Light and Power Company's depreciation expense. A new consumer body questions the need for a rate increase at this time. More than 20 young people enrolled in a program to broaden their opportunities. And in sports, Royals and Warriors set for battle in the CPL's first qualifier tomorrow. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening, I'm Lisa Bruma. Thank you so much for tuning in. In our top story tonight, the intervener team of Trisha Watson and David Simpson has called into question the depreciation rates that will be used by the Fair Trading Commission to form part of the decision on whether and how much of a rate increase to give the Barbados Light and Power Company. Ms. Watson outlined the team's position as day four of the hearing got underway at the Acre Beach Hotel this morning. Now, as explained by one of the interveners, depreciation rates are a critical part of the rate hearing. They're used to calculate the company's depreciation expense and asset base. These two figures are used to come up with the company's revenue requirements and in turn calculate what customers will be asked to pay. Ms. Watson argued the current rates being used by the FTC are incorrect. The Commission will be acting unreasonably if the Commission proceeds to hear evidence based on incorrect data and calculations in this application, and to force the interveners to conduct cross-examination of witnesses who will be relying on data and calculations that we all know to be false. The list above shows that we are talking about significant evidence and significant portions of the application. In addition to being legally wrong, it, to put it colloquially, it simply will not make any sense to proceed with the examination of witnesses until the application is amended. Objecting to the motion, attorney for the power company, King's counsel, Roman Allen, said the Watson-Simpson motion has no basis. The applicant is being asked to refile a depreciation on the basis of the 2009 ruling, ignore two depreciation studies updated 2017-2019, ignore the Commission's ruling in March 2020 that approved rates and methodology of the depreciation filings, ignore that the issue is still live in the present proceedings and therefore can be reviewed and tested, and incur the substantial costs associated with what they're effectively requesting, which is a shutdown of these proceedings. I would say it's not supported by law. They don't have the right to review presently. They have not moved to the court to have it appealed. And it does not make basic common sense. Well, Chair of the rate hearing, Dr. Donnelly Carrington, made a decision at 2 p.m. against the motion. The Commission is satisfied that there is no reason at this stage to direct the Barbados Light and Power Company to amend its application to file amended depreciation schedules pursuant to the Commission decision dated the 25th of February 2009 or otherwise or to adjust other calculated values that are dependent on the depreciation policy and rates. The Commission is also satisfied that the issue of depreciation rates for generation plant assets can be conveniently determined in these proceedings now before the Commission. A new consumer protection body, the Barbados Consumer Empowerment Network, says there must be an alternative to proposals for a rate increase by the BLNP. Interim Executive Director of BC, Maureen Holder, told the People's Business on CBC TV 8 last night the utility should instead be finding ways to reduce rates. And you're coming to us and saying, look, we cannot give you the type of service that you want unless you give us this money. What is the risk to the light and power? That's the fundamental question. You're taking a very low risk, and the only people that are going to be benefiting from this uh, proposed rate increase are the shareholders, the people who are involved in the American uh, uh, group of companies. So that's the kind of thing that we want to say to them. We're not ready for this. We're now coming out of the heels of the COVID. We are really facing 
facing dire times and not know, no, in fact, what we want, I would dare say, is low electricity rates, if anything. For a long time, hmm. we've been paying high electricity rates. So what we want is basically low electricity rates, not necessarily high electricity rates. Participants in the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment's first Scholastic Aptitude Test, or SAT, have been told to grab the opportunity and to remain focused. The advice from Minister of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment, Charles Griffith, who's also called the program an investment in the future. Trevor Thorpe has those details. 22 national athletes are the ambassadors of the Scholastic Aptitude Test SAT program organized by the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment. And in his address to the athletes at the launching ceremony at the offices, Minister Charles Griffith told them to make the best use of the opportunity they have been offered and not to become distracted by external forces. He told the athletes it is an investment by government in the youth of Barbados. This program will roll out online. Um, sometimes it will happen here at the ministry face to face. We will make the facilities available to the coordinator to do her program here. But after this, it is preparation. I suspect that at the end of um, the training, results will be back and persons will be able to source the university. Scholastic Aptitude Test Coordinator and tutor Kim Jones gave some background into the exercise. I am glad that this opportunity has been afforded to you so that you can see the opportunities that the SATs are able to afford to you. The only issue that stands is what are you willing to invest? How much time are you willing to invest? How much research are you willing to invest? I will assist you, and I will assist you as far as you are willing to push yourself. Everyone is right, the world is your oyster, but you have to do some work in order to open that oyster. The minister said he is pleased with the response to the program, which will be an annual affair. This is not a one-off exercise, this is the um, the launch, but this will continue every year for those persons who are seeking an opportunity to go to study. Um, part of government, part of our remit here is to try to see how many scholarships we can get overseas. And this is just um, one of the foundation stages of getting those athletes overseas by using the SAT's training because you can't get into a U.S. university unless this is covered. So government is taking the, 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 the frontal step and, and preparing those students. The Scholastic Aptitude Test exercise of the Ministry of Youth, Sport and Community Empowerment will run for one month. Trevor Thorpe, CBC News. A total of 20 new COVID-19 cases, 7 males and 13 females, were recorded from the 206 tests conducted yesterday by laboratories across the island. The cases consisted of 12 people under the age of 18 and 8 who were 18 years and older. There were 31 people in isolation facilities, while 241 were in home isolation. As at September 26, there were 559 COVID-19 related deaths. Coming up on Newsnight, progress reported in relation to repairing homes damaged by Hurricane Elsa. Stay with us. Government is reporting significant progress regarding repairing homes damaged by Hurricane Elsa. Minister of Housing and MP for St. George South, Dwight Sutherland, says 1,746 homes were impacted all across the island. According to him, over 200 Barbadians were provided with materials to complete their repairs and have done so. 37 Barbadians, meanwhile, stand to benefit from the 150 light-gauge steel homes being constructed by government. Minister Sutherland notes that of the remaining 1,496 of 96, officials have repaired and rebuilt 73% of them. We have finished 554. Breaking down in rebuilds 436 repairs and 118 rebuilds. So we have finished at 554 out of that thousand and, and out of the 1496. And we have started work in progress 537 of those houses. 
Minister Sutherland was speaking at his constituency branch meeting. Delivering the report, he highlighted the progress made in tackling a range of other issues, including infrastructure, transportation and water challenges. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley has been paying tribute to the late Pan-Africanist Bobby Clark, who passed away over the weekend. She says if she had to describe him in a few words, it would be a man apart. Ms. Motley says in any grouping, Bobby stood out, not by accident or chance, but by design. The Prime Minister says she will remember him as a fearless fighter for the underdog, the one who would not hesitate to champion the cause of the poor or unrepresented. Whether it meant a battle with the titans of business, the government or powerful interests elsewhere. According to Prime Minister Motley, anyone who had the honor of spending time with him soon came to understand that he was imbued with a commitment and passion for fairness and justice with the protection, with the protection rather, of the dignity of the working class at the core. She says when there was political turmoil in Grenada in the 1970s and 80s, Bobby was there. When he felt his voice could make a difference in the politics of Trinidad and Guyana, he made sure the world heard him. He was the consummate fighter. The Prime Minister extended sincere condolences to all his children and the rest of the Clark family on behalf of the government and people of Barbados. Also paying tribute is Barbados' ambassador to CARICOM, David Comichon. We lost one of our great sons, great sons of Barbados, a great son of the Caribbean. I speak of Robert Bobby Clark, the very well-known Barbadian attorney at law, political activist, um, who believed to his core in Caribbean integration and in the concept of, of one Caribbean. We lost him yesterday at the, at the age of, of 90. General Secretary for the Caribbean Movement of Peace and Integration, David Denny, is encouraging Pan-Africanists, socialists and Caribbean people to spend the next seven days in mourning for Mr. Clark. And Prime Minister Motley has also been paying tribute to Charles Tibbetts. She says his passing has left a void which cannot be easily filled. Mr. Tibbetts, the long-standing partner at PricewaterhouseCooper, a key member of the Barbados Chamber of Commerce and Industry and a tax consultant, passed away last Thursday. The Prime Minister said Mr. Tibbetts was a true treasure in our midst, quiet and unassuming, whose expertise had been valued by several administrations over the years and was always a gentleman, no matter how strongly opinions differed. She said for many, his post-budget analyses and commentary provided, uh, proved rather to be a critical component in helping Barbadians to understand not only the implications of measures government would have employed, but why they have been enacted. The Prime Minister extended sincere condolences to the Tibbetts family. Two young men were shot and wounded in two separate shootings yesterday. The first occurred around 8.30 in the morning at Bottom Close, Wilde St. Michael. The Barbados Police Service received a report of a shooting in an alleyway and on arrival they learned a young male was transported by private motor car to a medical facility for attention. That young man received a gunshot wound to his neck. The other shooting incident took place in the car park of a local business around 4.35 p.m. It was revealed several young men were in the car park of the Saul Banyan Court on Bay Street when they were approached by two men who opened fire on them. One of the young men received an injury to his left foot. He was transported by ambulance to a medical facility for attention. Anyone who can assist police with their investigations into the shootings is asked to contact the police. And lawmen are appealing to the public for any information regarding a shooting at the Ivy this morning around 10. Information reaching the CBC indicates there was an exchange of gunfire between two individuals. No injuries were reported and there was no damage to property. Police responded in their numbers, but by the time they arrived, the individuals had fled the scene. Barbadian superstar Rihanna will headline this season's NFL Super Bowl halftime show. Rihanna, 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 Rihanna.
Rihanna is this year's Super Bowl halftime headliner. The entertainer and the National Football League both tweeted a photo Sunday of her hand holding a football before the NFL confirmed the news in a statement calling Rihanna a once-in-a-generation artist. Super Bowl 57 is scheduled for February 12th in Glendale, Arizona. Let's head over to the sports studio now where Anne-Marie Burke is standing by with the day's details. Good evening, Anne-Marie. Good evening to you, Lisa. We start on this news that over the next three days, Barbados' top female track and field athlete, Shade Williams, who is home on a short break, is on a tour of some selected schools to offer words of motivation and encouragement to young athletes and students. The tour kicked off today where it all started for the star athlete at her alma mater, the Corrigan Paris School. Their golden girl was back home, if only for a couple of hours. Top Barbados athlete Shade Williams was given a hero's welcome at her alma mater Courage and Parry, the place where it all started for the 24-year-old track and field athlete to signal the start of a school tour which will span over the next two days at selected schools. The world and NACAC 400 meter bronze medalist and Commonwealth gold medalist was showered with gifts and lauded by her former teachers for her outstanding performance throughout this year. It was also the opportunity for Shade to show off her medals with the students. She also had some words of advice. I had some of my best days at the Courage and Paris School and will forever be grateful for the foundation it laid for me. I want to encourage each one of you to stay disciplined and focused while pursuing your dreams and remember no dream is too big. Just work hard and believe in yourself once you're knowing that as part of the battle one. Physical education teacher Dave Small, who was one of Shade's first coaches at school, said her journey is one that can be an inspiration to other students, as she was not at first a lover of sports. Now Shade went out there, I remember in third form, because she's born in December, December 1st, right? It's her birthday, and she had to run against the form girls, and she defeated them. A third form girl because of her um, birthday after the start of school year. And from then, I'm not sure what went through her mind, but I am sure that she might realize, well, I can do this thing, I got this. And she went on. So what we saw over the summer, gold medal at Commonwealth Games, bronze medal at the NACA Games, World Championship bronze medal, First female in Barbados to run under 50 seconds, and all her accomplishments started right here at Quarter Park School in third form at a house meet. After a quick photo op, Shade's next stop took her from the north to the south to the Christchurch Girls Primary School. This engagement was slightly different as students were given the opportunity to ask the track and field stars some questions and they really put her on the spot. Why did she get B? <laughs> I got B because I was too slow. And then came the serious questions. What is your best accomplishment? Um, I would have to say this year, um, getting uh, achieving a bronze medal at World Championships, which is the highest level for athletes. So that's my biggest accomplishment this year. Thank you. Shade also met a fellow national athlete, Kamika Johnson, who represented the island at the Goodwill Swimming Championships last month. So if a wave goodbye to the girls from Christchurch Primary, tomorrow she'll start with a visit to her other alma mater, Harrison College, and then to the Hinesbury Primary, before the tour culminates at her former primary school, Eden Lodge, on Wednesday. With COVID-19 travel restrictions easing around the globe, there was welcome news today from one of Barbados' key source markets. Anne-Marie Bailey has that story. Barbados' tourism officials expect major developments in Canada to significantly increase arrivals from that key source markets in the months ahead. 
Chief among them is today's announcement by Canada's federal government, lifting all inbound COVID travel restrictions effective October 1st. Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporated Director for Canada, Peter Mears, notes the news was met with rejoicing as it enhances the overall sentiment to travel and adds the development is timely. Well, it comes at a good time for us. We are at the doorstep of winter and uh, with WestJet returning uh, at the end of October, October 31st, and Air Canada ramping up to daily um, again, uh, we think this will help and this will push the surge in demand that we're seeing in a very favourable way uh, to partners on the ground. Uh, one of the things that WestJet in particular has been advocating for uh, very quietly behind the scenes uh, was, was an ease in the, the measures. So this announcement coming just as WestJet is about to restart uh, to Barbados is, is a good thing. Mr. Mears believes recently announced increased airlift from Canada to Barbados for the winter season will boost the sector. And it's coming at a time now where these measures uh, have been lifted uh, and there is such a demand um, for travel, leisure travel in particular, that we, we certainly will benefit from that. Air Canada will return to daily service uh, from about mid-October. Uh, the Montreal service for Air Canada, three weekly flights, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, that, that commences uh, mid-December. And then, as I said, WestJet. Uh, starting their, their service, four weekly flights, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and that's scheduled to commence October 31st. While the BTMI actively promotes Barbados within Canada, he explains that other domestic developments stand to benefit the sector, particularly out of Western Canada. The opportunity for us to grow business behind the gateway in Western Canada is, is quite right for the coming winter season. What this means for us certainly is the connectivity back into Toronto from Vancouver, from uh, Calgary, from Edmonton, is going to be strong. And it's the same thing with Air Canada as well. Seamless connections both through Toronto and Montreal. Prior to COVID-19, Canada accounted for approximately 13 to 15 percent of inbound travel to Barbados. Anne-Marie Bailey, CBC News. Thanks, Amory. Well, government's 146.5 million U.S. dollar dual currency blue loan facility is in place. The transaction between government, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank, the Nature Conservancy and the Inter-American Development Bank carries a unique development. It takes the form of a debt conversion that will unlock significant funding for marine conservation over the next 15 years. Credit risk officer at CIBC First Caribbean International Bank, Patrick McKenna, told the business report it formed part of the bank's support of the region's transaction to a low carbon economy. One of our strategic objectives is to continue to develop a range of financial and advisory solutions focused on environmental and social development matters of importance and collaborating with other regional and global partners in alignment with the broader responsible business practices embedded across CIBC First Caribbean. This debt conversion transaction is an excellent example of our contribution to creating a more sustainable future. Executive Officer Colette Delaney said the transaction demonstrates the bank's resolve to work with other agencies to help solve the complex challenges facing the region. It also demonstrates to our sovereign partners in the region our commitment to the sustainable development of the Caribbean. In this case, protecting Barbados's environmental heritage and supporting efforts to build a sustainable economy. Local conglomerate Goddard Enterprises Limited is spreading its wings. It's looking to spend 40 million U.S. dollars to acquire the International Meal Company of Panama, a firm which operates food and beverage concessions at the Tokumen International Airport in Panama City. Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Goddard Enterprises Limited, Anthony Ali, told the business report the move would connect the company with a vital hub in Central America. We've made a binding offer, which has been accepted. So technically, we're right now in the process of going through the legal machinations of getting all the paperwork done, making sure that everything is properly filed, and we are anticipating that the deal will officially close probably within the next 45 days. The company executive said Goddard Enterprises Limited is going through an acquisition and growth phase. 
Coming out of COVID, as I mentioned, there were lots and lots of opportunities that presented themselves. And we're fortunate enough to be in a position financially that we can actually capitalize on some of those. So for now, it's basically look at how we can continue to grow, how we can continue to add shareholder value for our existing shareholders, and how we can continue to grow as a multinational Barbadian company. And that's your news for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Good night. Thanks for visiting us. To get more stories like this one, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.